My name is Helen Christians, and I will be your MC this morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Sunday morning meeting of the Humanists of Greater Portland. It is my pleasure now to welcome Al Christians, who will be uh, doing our reading. Welcome, Al. Come on in. Okay, the reading today is from a wonderful book, The Practical Cogitator by Curtis and Greenslet. This book was pub so, so wonderful. It was published in 1945, published again in 1950, published again in 1962. And it's got a survey of thinking and history of philosophy and all those kinds of things kind of wound through it. And these two fellas, uh, Curtis and Greenslet, like this fellow named Bahinger, who was a German philosopher who lived from 1852 to 1933. And what I'm going to read, they say, is from Havelock Ellis's account of Bahinger in a, a German professor of philosophy who wrote his philosophy of the as if in 1876, but dared not publish it until 1911. Ellis introduced it in England in Dance of Life, from which this is taken. And uh, the concept of as if kind of relates to what we had. I had did a reading a few years back on Kurt Vonnegut, once humanist of the year, who uh, you know explained that yeah, all of all this, all the, our myths are are lies. All our stories are lies because we're not smart enough to know the truth, but uh, in many cases, you should live as if they were true. So this might be an older source of uh, Vonnegut's thinking. And the, the reading is, Vahinger's philosophy is not only of interest because it presents so clearly and rigorously a prevailing tendency in modern thought. Rightly understood, it supplies a fortifying influence to those who may have seen their cherished spiritual edifice, whatever it may be, fall around them and are attempted, tempted to a mood of disillusionment. We make our own world when we have made it awry, we can remake it approximately truer, though it cannot be absolutely true to the facts. It will never be finally made. We are always stretching forth to larger and better fictions, which answer more truly to our growing knowledge and experience. Even when we walk, it is only by a series of regulated errors. Weihinger well points out a perpetual succession of falls to one side and the other side. Our whole progress through life is of the same nature. All thinking is a regulated error. For we cannot, as Wahinger insists, choose our errors at random or in, court, in accordance with what happens to please us. Such fictions are only too likely to turn into deadening dogmas. The old vis dormitia, dormitivia, <laughs> ooh, he's got, they've got Latin in here, is the type of them, mere husks that are of no vital use and help us not at all. There are good fictions and bad fictions, just as there are good poets and bad poets. It is in the choice and regulation of our errors and our readiness to accept ever closer approximations to the unattainable reality that we think rightly and live rightly. We triumph in so far as we succeed in that regulation. A lost battle, Foch, French general of World War I, quoting De Maistre, lays down in his Principles de Guerre, is a battle one thinks one has lost. The battle is won by the fiction that it is won. It is so also in the battle of life, in the whole art of living. Freud regards dreaming as fiction that helps us to sleep, thinking, we may regard as fiction that helps us to live. Man lives by the imagination, or as Wahinger's critics would say, or at least he can imagine that. So it's now my pleasure, my great pleasure. I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Gordon Orans, 
Uh, Dr. Renz is a professor emeritus of biology at the University of Washington in Seattle. He received his PhD in zoology from the University of California, Berkeley in August of 1960. At the University of Washington, he served as the director of the university's Institute for Environmental Studies. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1989 and to the American Academy of Arts uh, and Sciences in 1990. Uh, he did extensive research, uh, has uh, been behavioral ecology, primarily with problems of habitat selection. His most recent uh, research focused on human emotional responses to environment. Uh, and this activity uh, was motivated by his general concern with issues of deteriorating environmental quality. He pioneered the adaptation of research tools and concepts from behavioral ecology for use in the study of habitat selection by humans. His research has involved cooperation with psychologists and geographers, planners, and even landscape painters. Um, his presentation today is, in, is entitled, The World Into Which Darwin Led Us. Uh, it's an honor to have you share our, your vast knowledge with us today. Please welcome and uh, thank you so much for your willingness to join us. Thank you so much. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. After that, I can hardly wait to hear what I have to say. <laughs> um, it's interesting that my, my topic really flows very lovely, well, interestingly from the reading about errors because actually natural selection is by mistakes, by errors in the duplication of DNA, which also makes it rather hard to understand why evolution actually works that way. So let's explore this a little bit. What uh, up until the time of, of Darwin, uh, people knew that uh, there was a lot of problems with the religious explanation, but they didn't have any alternative explanation for adaptations. And there's adaptation all around us. And normally one thinks when you see clear adaptations, there, there must be a designer, somebody designed this. And over most of human history, the only available designer was some God or group of gods. And, uh, and that was what everybody believed in all societies. And Darwin's great dangerous idea was that I will give you design without a designer and here's how it works. So that's a radical idea that sort of upended the thinkings about causation in Western intellectual life and probably about, about it everywhere else. So even though uh, Darwin has, so, so to speak, triumphed, and there's uh, most people now nominally at least accept that the world is driven by this, but uh, I want to show you and explain to you that most people, including many biologists, don't really understand what Darwin said and how unusual it is the ideas that he gave us. So uh, with that uh, brief introduction, let's plow into it. So. Uh, we know that we now know, though Darwin did not know this, but we, we now know that uh, the genetic information is stored in a complex molecule called DNA. And we also know that DNA has the basis for its own reproduction, so that every time a cell divides, uh, the, uh, the DNA also uh, unravels and makes a new copy of itself, so that now we have from one cell, we now have two cells, each which has a copy of the DNA. So it's this duplication which happens every time a cell divides. And the problem is that the duplication of DNA is highly accurate. But it's, if it weren't highly accurate, it wouldn't be any good for storing information. But it's not 100% accurate because if it were 100% accurate, there wouldn't be any evolution because there would never be any changes. So there are occasional mistakes and what Darwin said, occasionally, some of these, not many, many of them, but some of them will be useful and, become, and spread and becoming, become incorporated into a population. So how does that happen? Well, the, the main, in order for them to be, the mutations to be cast along uh, to the future, they have to uh, occur for us animals in, in, in uh, testes or, or ovaries, because those are the only the place where the cells are passed on. But 
Mutations are occurring in all of the rest of the cells of our bodies. These are called somatic mutations. They don't get passed on. Uh, the fact that I'm not as athletic as I, I was when I was younger doesn't worry my son uh, because that doesn't get cast on, passed on to him. But these uh, declines are actually due to the accumulation of all these somatic mutations and all the rest of the cells of our body. And that's part of what leads to what we call uh, senility. And uh, just as, a, as an aside, what I've just described is true for animals. It is not true for vascular plants because vascular plants don't have anything like testes or ovaries. Uh, they don't have any sex cells, anything is set aside. And when flowers appear on different branches of a tree, all the accumulated uh, mutations uh, that have occurred and all the cell lines leading to that are expressed uh, in, in the uh, flowers. And, the, and so as a result, uh, the flowers are very, maybe genetically very different on different sides of the tree. So plants are very different. I'll just leave it, leave it at that. So, so let's look at what Darwin basically says that there will be a rare mutation. So something that crops up will be very rare and only one or a few individuals will have it. So the real problem of, of understanding Darwinism is how can a trait spread when it's very rare? And this is something that is not well understood by a lot of people, including many biologists, because uh, often when you look at what are the explanations of things, uh, it already assumes that it's very, very common. Let me give you an example that has interested me a lot, the origin and evolution of music, because we are the world's most musical animal, but all other apes and monkeys are remarkably unusual. They're much less musical than birds and whales. Uh, Birds form cult cultures and dialects and all sorts of stuff. Primates don't at all. So uh, we are we are primates are really very very dull. So how could something like music have gotten started? And it was very very rare. Let me give you an example uh, for which I have no evidence, but it allows us to say this is how we should think about it. And let's imagine we've got, we've gotten uh, uh, one of our ancestors has developed a vocal ability and is able to make the sounds of a wounded rabbit. And he goes out and he makes the sound of a wounded rabbit. And a fox thinks there's a wounded rabbit there, comes in, gets close, and the guy is able to kill it. And then he comes back into the camp that night, showing off his rabbit and explaining the, the beautiful sound he's made and, and how he could do it and everybody's impressed and he's very unlikely to sleep alone that night. So it's interesting, this is to say apocryphal, but it says it provides an, a way for which a trait to spread when it's very, very rare. And it provides the uh, who's being communicated with. And the interesting thing about this example, one, it involves deception and who's being deceived is not another human being, but an animal of a different species. Uh, there's a lot of deception like that in nature. We call it mimicry and various other things going on. So there's a lot of that in nature. And it's plausible that that's what could have happened as a way of thinking about the evolution of music. So I'm, I'm not proposing that as a determined thing, but as an example of how to think about something like the origin of music. And we have to think what got it started is almost certainly totally different from what maintains it now when everybody has it and inspires us and we go dancing and wonderful things happen when we listen to music. That couldn't have been anything like what happened at the beginning and caused it to spread. Let me give you another example which is related to this and this is then the evolution of communication signals. Uh, animals uh, do a lot of communicating with one another uh, and we've, we've evolved a lot of signals. Uh, the, the purpose of a communication signal is to influence the behavior of another animal, another individual, uh, in ways that are favorable to the communicator. But this imposed very serious uh, Darwinian kind of constraints because uh, a trait, uh, it has to be, the signal has to be something that the, recipient can respond to in a way that benefits the recipient. Otherwise it would be ignored. 
if, if I can't respond to something that with anything that does me any good, I'll ignore it. So uh, the recipient has to be able to uh, respond in a way that benefits the recipient. But uh, it also has to be that the re recipient can't use that information to get back and, and uh, do damage to the signaler. So uh, there are really very, very tight constraints on the evolution of communication signals. And uh, I've just described the constraints of what they are. And, uh, and this doesn't mean that communication can't be very, very rich what it is. And it also lets us know that it can be communication between individuals of very different species, as long as there's a response that has those characteristics. This is something that is very poorly understood uh, because a lot of people think just communication is just, that's to tell other people good things so that they know all about it. But an awful lot of communication involves as that answer, that the example I gave deceit. And we see it uh, all over how uh, animals and plants derive ways to, to deceive one another. And we love it, of course. Uh, and we like to invent games that allow us to deceive one another. Uh, probably, the, probably the most uh, dramatic example of this is the game of poker, in which the whole point is to deceive somebody else that uh, try to make them believe you have something you don't have. And, and to win at, at uh, his or her expense. And the same is, of course, of true of all competitive sports. Now, let's, let's take baseball. Uh, the, the team will, for a given pitcher, will do all the analyses and figure out exactly what, the, what sort of throws this particular pitcher, pitch, pitcher has, but you don't know what he's going to throw in, in a particular moment. And so uh, there's a signal and the the catcher and the pitcher agree what he's going to throw, but the batter doesn't know. So the point of view of the, and the batter has to decide by the time the, that ball leaves the pitcher's hands, uh, what it's going to be, because if he waits to see what's happening, uh, the ball is already in the catcher's hand and the, and the umpire says strike one. So uh, what really good batters read what, watch what the pitcher is doing when, when he is getting ready to throw. And they have decided which of the array of pitches that pitcher will throw uh, is going to be. He makes a guess. And the good batters are better at guessing that than the poorer batters. So the world is full of all of this deceit. And uh, a lot of communication uh, involves uh, bettering ourselves and often at the expense of other individuals. And this doesn't mean that uh, when we're say communicating stuff for our kids, we try to be accurate and they learn all about it. But an awful lot of communication is otherwise. I listen to young people today and I can't understand what they're saying. And it occurs to me, they don't want me to know. They're very happy that I don't know what they're saying because they, they want to carry on a conversation and talk about a lot of stuff and they really don't want me to understand. And that has included my own kids, unfortunately. But okay, so uh, let me pass on to one thing that uh, there's a lot of fuzzy thinking about this going on today. Uh, and you read about it and you probably all read about it, talking trees and how trees are communicating one another and all of this. Well, of course, trees don't talk. Uh, they don't have any vocal cords in the business. So this is shorthand to say that it's one way or another, trees are communicating with one another. Well, how could trees be communicating with one another? How could a, a, a rare tree that decides to communicate something has a mutation that communicates something, how could this go? Well, uh, we know the remarkable things are going on. If, I'm, if I take a, a branch of, a, of a, a leaf of a tree and say, cause damage with the scissors to the to the uh, the leaf it will emit chemicals uh, that signal that it, it has actually been hurt but if I do that and make the cut well, well I well my scissors has got caterpillar uh, saliva on it the tree will emit totally different uh, uh, chemicals so it's different if some other, uh, tree or other parts of the same tree can know that this has been caused by a, 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 a caterpillar. So the, the tree 
may be releasing information, but who, who could it be for? And my guess is that it's simply for other branches of the same tree, because uh, one of the things that's different about predation on trees is that it very seldom kills them. Uh, it causes some damage, but the tree survived. And the tree is big enough and complicated enough that uh, other cells and, and leaves and other parts of the tree could respond to this by, by uh, building up their chemicals, uh, chemical defenses, and because the caterpillars are likely to, to be around. So it, it seems easy to explain how a tree could be uh, releasing information that is good to itself and other parts of the tree. But how about communicating to other trees? What, how could that possibly happen? And without going into great detail, um, uh, in discussion, we can go into this further if you like, but I think it's absolute nonsense that trees are doing that. And trees have intimate relations with mycorrhizal fungi that provide the nutrition for the trees and the trees pay, pay for the fungi. And the fungi are connected and almost certainly all that connection is, is driven by and benefits the fungi, not the trees itself. So fungi are, of course, they're wonderful. Uh, they make our beer and wine and bread and everything else, but um, uh, they're also, I think, involved in the connections between trees. So these are a couple examples of, say, how you approach problems from a Darwinian perspective, okay? And all of that thinking about how, what might be happening in trees where we're thinking from a Darwinian perspective, how can the trees reproductive, survive and reproductive success uh, be enhanced by doing something? And it's the, the way people are currently thinking about all the wonderful talking between trees doesn't seem to pass, pass that test to me. So I could give some more, more examples, but let me, in the interest of time, let me move on to something else that uh, is important and has evolved in our, our interactions with, with one another and other animals. Uh, an important uh, development in our thinking that relates to how we relate to other organisms is what uh, the philosopher Daniel Dennett had called the intentional stance. That is, we assume that some other organism has intentions and that by knowing those intentions, we will uh, benefit ourselves. This is very likely, for example, so I'm a hunter and I'm, I'm gonna go out hunting rabbits. And if I ask myself, if I were a rabbit, where would I hide to be safe from predators? And that is likely to help me in finding rabbits, even though it is very unlikely that the rabbit is actually thinking anything like that. Uh, but it doesn't matter whether the rabbit is thinking that or not, it's going to help me catch rabbits. And so we do this with all sorts of organisms and we adopt the intentional stance and we assume that they're thinking or doing things. And we think by putting ourselves into their minds and thinking how, how would they be looking at the, the environment, uh, it's likely to improve our ability to uh, get along with them, use them in whatever ways we want. And of course we do this all the time now. We, we impute all sorts of things, uh, not only to talking trees, but we know that our pets have all these intentions in doing this. And uh, uh, one of the important messages of Darwinism is that there's a lot of competence without comprehension. That is, organisms evolve to have marvelly adaptive behavior, and they don't have to understand what they're doing. There is competence without comprehension. And uh, when Darwin first proposed this, it seems sort of crazy. Most of us now have a better understanding can grasp that just knowing about computers. Uh, computers just full of a lot of things that either fire or don't fire pluses or minuses. And the computer has no intention and that there's no, there's no master computer link in there, but we can build enough into that computer that you can get enough competence that a, a computer can beat to the best chess player in the world. And this emerges, even though there's no element of the computer that knows anything about anything and understands at all what it does. Uh, so the computer has competence. We're quite certain it has no comprehension. And an awful lot of animals have comp 
competence, and they have less comprehension than we often think they have. So this is very important, how we keep relating to animals uh, and, and to plants, uh, because uh, we relate to them in ways that we assuming that they have these intentions. And this might actually be a good thing in looking at nature, because uh, if we think these animals have uh, intentions and are, are sentient in that way, we are more likely to treat them re reasonably uh, than if we don't. If we assume they don't have that. And uh, part of the problem with modern society is that we tend not to think about them very much and don't care what we do to them. So that's probably not a very good idea. So um, that's an, another important aspect of our thinking about about evolution that uh, based on Darwinian thinking, uh, and it's very important to remember how important it is that the world exists with competence without any comprehension. Let me give one, one other example of uh, something that's very fascinating. We were, were fantastically interested in it and how the answer is uh, de determined by Darwinian-oriented simple arithmetic. Uh, what we know is for most uh, sexually reproducing organisms that roughly the same number of males and females are produced. Uh, and we know that uh, uh, you don't need all those males. In fact, you don't need any males at all. I'm sad to report that there, there are organisms, uh, there are lizards in Southwest US where they're entirely female. The females produce a parthenogenetically and produce daughters uh, that produce only daughters. And so there's no males around there. And, and we males are really not necessary, but the world is full of us. How come there's so many of us when we're really not necessary? Well, this gets back to the interesting, uh, interesting thing, which involves a simple arithmetic. In sexually reproducing organisms, each individual has one father, and one mother. So that uh, the half of the genes in, in a population come from males and half come from females. Uh, and in the next, when they're passed on to the next generation, half of the genes will come from males and half of them will come from females. So that means males as a group are worth the same amount as females as a group. However, Let's suppose that there are many, for some reason, there are many more males than females in the population. What that means is that for the, as we count genes the next generation, all those extra males will have contributed just the same number that the smaller number of females did because each offspring has one male and one female. So that means whichever sex is more abundant in this hypothetical example is males, uh, they are individually worth less because the per capita contribution to the next generation of males will be less than that of females because more of them are contributing the same number of genes that a smaller number of females do. And that works the other way around. The females are more abundant. So what that means is that uh, we know that uh, the complications of what makes males and females in the sexual reproduction is not quite as simple as we often think it is. So that if there is an excess of males, uh, an individual that produces more female offspring than male will be advantageous. She'll have a, a greater uh, contribution to the next generation. And so what that ends up with roughly equal numbers of males and females being produced. Uh, and natural selection tends to bring it back that way. And there are interesting complications to this. Uh, Aldo Leopold, who founded uh, conservation biology and wildlife management, was dealing with the problem of overpopulation of deer in Wisconsin. Uh, and there was a, a buck season and they tried to extend the buck season, but Leopold recognized that you're not gonna control the number of deer being born by harvesting bucks. <laughs> because the remaining bucks, unless you eliminate all the bucks, the remaining bucks will be happy to inseminate all the remaining females. So uh, he said, we have to have a doe season. And he was pillories and Bambi killer and all of that sort of stuff. But he recognized if you want to control deer populations by hunting, you have to shoot does. And that's true. Another little side example that I just find fascinating 
uh, our dairy cattle. And we, of course, every dairy cow is bred every year. She produces a calf. Now, half of those are going to be male. And they're not going to make milk. Uh, they're, they're kind of useless. But uh, we figured out how, how to make use of the fact that inevitably, half the calves born to uh, dairy cattle are going to be useless males. We, we figured out how to, how to use them. We can to treat them very special, give them a special diet, and uh, market them as a very uh, special food that doesn't taste anything like beef and it's wonderful. Uh, and we now have a wonderful market in it and it's called veal. Doesn't taste anything like beef. That's, that's how we make use of all those extra meals that aren't gonna produce any milk and, and, and eggs and, and milk and cheese. So uh, the, fa the fact that natural selection results in almost equal numbers, pretty close to equal numbers of males and females is explicable in this way and it has interesting uh, consequences that uh, uh, play out in, in various sort of ways that are practical implications to us. So this is just another example of how thinking about things in Darwinian terms uh, can really uh, affect population, public decisions, and we can understand them and how, how they uh, operate as they do because we understand Darwinian selection. I'm gonna close by uh, commenting on what a wonderful thing Darwinian evolution is. As a result of this, we have understanding now of uh, how we, who we are, the big questions that we all wanna ask and philosophers all ask, who are we, where did we come from, why are we here, where are we going? Well we now have answers to the great philosophical questions. We have a detailed fossil record now. Uh, we know about the, the evolution of, of, of us. Uh, we have natural selection that tells us a lot about why we are what we are. Uh, and so the great philosophical questions that um, philosophers has worried about for, for centuries and still seem to worry a lot about uh, we actually have answers to those, uh, and they're rather exciting answers. And I personally find these answers much more exciting than assuming that there's some entity somewhere uh, that is pulling strings and that uh, the advantage of having an entity pulling strings is that you can cut deals, of course, uh, with somebody running them. And that, of course, uh, uh, is, is so much, I've just described the history of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, there, we will cut deals for you. Uh, we've got the hotline, we'll cut deals for you. Give us some money and we'll cut some deals. Uh, but Darwin says there's nobody to cut deals with. There's, there's, there's no, um, the moral, the universe is ethically and morally neutral. Uh, we sometimes think of, you know, the, there's the arc of the universe that's going to head toward justice. Martin Luther King talked a lot about that. Of course, he was a Baptist preacher and he probably really, really believed that. But as far as we can tell now, the, the universe is morally neutral, but we also know that we are not, we are strongly ethical. And we also understand now how strong ethical feelings uh, have evolved as a result of natural selection and a very complex a socially complex organism that evolved very, very big brains, and that happens to be us. So ethics and morality also has evolved via Darwinian selection uh, in the evolution of a very co socially complex, unbelievably intelligent organism. And so we are not ethically neutral. Uh, we have our own strong feelings. And we also know that we're born with them. Uh, I've, I've talked to some religious people and I said, if I were to convince you tomorrow that there wasn't a God, would I suddenly expect you to be mean to me? No, you won't be. You won't be. You'll be nice to me because you want to. We've evolved to do that. So the Darwinian world is full of hope. It's full of wonderful stuff. Uh, I've personally had a wonderful life uh, plowing in the fields of Darwinism. I don't expect that most people 
should or would want to. We only need a few jerks like me out there trying to explain this. But what I'd like to suggest is that really trying to understand this world, how strange it is, and how, uh, yes, it's driven by copy errors, and occasionally copy errors are useful, but, and that's a rather strange way to think about the world. And in fact, I've seen uh, moral philosophers and religious philosophers would actually say, in the, you don't want to believe in a world like that, do you? And a lot of people don't. They want the morality to be other than what we've generated. But the, the wonderful world of, of, of Darwinism says, we now understand a lot about these things. We know why, and we know how to pose questions and go on to a few, uh, follow it up. So the world into which I've spent my life delving the, the, the Darwinian fields has to me been wonderfully exciting. Uh, and this really, uh, I've, had, I've had an absolutely wonderful life. I don't think all of you should try to join me, but I do think that you can gain some degree of satisfaction and comprehension of understanding a little bit better than you probably do now why Darwin's idea was so absolutely dangerous and how it totally upended Western concepts of causality. It's a strange world, but it's worth knowing about. Thank you. Oh, Gordon, thank you so much. That has left us all a lot to think about. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked for many years at the Oregon Burns Center and your, you know, your whole idea of the, the wonders of the world and to watch how um, the miracle of uh, that our own bodies can heal itself and then how medicine can help that process. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, why, I've always felt, why believe in the supernatural when the natural is so much more um, exciting and interesting as far as I'm concerned, you know, it's just a wonderful place. Well, the, what, the, the terrible thing about the supernatural is you can never figure out how it works. I mean, all the philosophers trying to deal with the problem of evil, mm -hmm. which is created by assuming there's a God loving God. And then how come if there's this loving God, there's all this evil? Well, all of that disappears. Right. Uh, if you say there isn't a loving God that set it up, then uh, the world looks look pretty much like you would expect to uh, look like. Uh, and the, the, the problem, the philosophical problem goes away, the practical problem stays there, but it's much more exciting to be able to understand that and to say God works in very strange ways. Right. Um, how, old, how old was Darwin when he, I know he, he got the ideas early in his life, yeah. but he published quite, I believe, and I may be in error, but quite late in life. How old was he when he published? I can't answer that directly, but I can give you a little background on that, why it was so late. Uh, well, he had a long time figuring out this idea. And the notion is he went around on the beagle and got to the Galapagos and saw the finch and discovered evolution is absolutely wrong. Uh, and if you can read The Voyage of the Beagle, which is wonderful because you could see his mind unfolding, uh, you, he didn't get it at all then. So it took a long time for this idea, because it is such a strange idea, mm -hmm. uh, to emerge. Then also, his, his wife, Emma Wedgwood, uh, of the Wedgwood Pottery, was his cousin, uh, was deeply religious, and he, he didn't want to offend her. He really was very much in love with her. Uh, but uh, he married his cousin, and, and they had some uh, inbreeding problems with their kids. And it's sort of ironical that that's what Darwin had. But he was sitting on it and working on it and not wanting to do anything. And his hand was finally forced by Alfred Russell Wallace, who was working in, in Indonesia. And in a bout of malaria, he conceived of the idea of natural selection. And he wrote up, uh, wrote a letter. It's now known as the letter from Ternate. And he sent it to Darwin. I think you might find this interesting. And, and Darwin had almost had a coronary because I've been scooped. And who knows what, what ended up then that the, his friends knew all of this and they arranged for a reading at the Royal Society and they read Wallace's paper and Darwin composed something that he wrote uh, and they both got credit for it. But how long Darwin would have waited if Wallace hadn't forced his, or forced his hand, we'll never know. He, he was a procrastinator first class. Yeah, and, and a human being. 
he was a he 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 had fear with the knowledge he possessed. It sounds like a bit of trepidation. Yes. Oh, he had also he, he knew how radical his idea was. Yeah. And uh, he was uh, he he knew it wasn't going to receive a happy reception, and it didn't. Right. And 150 years later, it's still having trouble. Right. And Kathy, I'm. Uh, you have a que a comment about Darwin and Huxley. Can you please enter? I hope that many of you have read The Voyage of the Beagle, and I hope that many of you are aware that Thomas Henry Huxley was called Darwin's bulldog because he defended um, Darwin's views on evolution when he was being attacked. <clears throat> what you may not know is that early in the 19th century, lots of young Englishmen were taking posts on uh, Navy ships going around the world to uh, do things besides uh, just explore the, uh, the geography. So um, in addition to Darwin uh, being on the, the Eagle between 1831 and 1836, uh, Thomas Henry Huxley, as a young comparative anatomist, was on the HMS Rattlesnake between 1846 and 1850. So that was about what, 15 years later. Uh -huh. uh, so the best present that Val ever gave me was this book called the T.H. Huxley's Diary of the Voyage of the HMS Rattlesnake. Uh -huh. So an interesting contrast with the Voyage of the Beagle. The most interesting thing is they didn't go to all the same places, but they went to some of the same places, okay. um, such as Tasmania. And it's interesting to read what uh, they did wherever they went because although our speaker emphasized that Darwin didn't instantly come up with the idea of evolution, he nevertheless reports in The Voyage of the Beagle what he saw and what he's thinking about and what he's wondering about and what he's chosen to go look for in terms of examples of things. So um, there's such a contrast between that and Huxley, who did not come up with evolution. He, he cataloged an awful lot of animals along the way, but um, he mostly went to dances and balls and parties and, and fell in love and got engaged. And so if you compare the section in The Voyage of the Beagle, where uh, Darwin is talking about tramping around these hills in Tasmania and what he saw there, doesn't say, oh, oh, evolution, but it does say, here's what I saw, here's what I looked at. Whereas the same Tasmania, here's uh, Thomas Henry Huxley going to all these parties and having a great time and commenting about how the natives uh, really liked his clothes and things of that sort. So very different reactions by two young men from the same culture, close to the same time, doing close to the same thing. Yeah. And I think that's fascinating. So this is, this is as I say, say, the best book, best present I ever got because I didn't know it existed. And Val found it at Powell's and he knew I'd be fascinated by it. So read Huxley and read Voyage of the Beagle too. Well, may I respond to that? Yes, please. Was this, Huxley is interesting because when he read The Origin of Species, his reaction was, how stupid of me not to have thought of that. But, but actually he was wrong. It was very hard to have thought of that because as I've tried to describe, what a crazy idea in many ways Darwin's notion of natural selection is. It's not at all obvious. You can go around and look. It's, it was a very difficult idea to conceive of because it just turned sense of causality upside down. So uh, Huxley was wrong when he said how stupid of me not to have thought about it. It was genuinely hard to think of. Let's see, I've got a comment here from Robert Sanford. Uh, he, he says, Darwin was 50 when he published. He oh. was 22 when he sailed out on the Beagle, Beagle and 27 when he came home. That was, a, he was five years out. I'll be yes. It was a long, long voyage. Yeah. And he was seasick all the time. Oh my, <laughs> oh, and still was able to do all this research. That's pretty amazing. Thank you, Robert, for sharing that with us. Thanks. Yeah, Joyce has a comment here. Um, Joyce Lackey, I wonder if there is any correlation between concept of intentional stance 
in science and the arts. May I elaborate on that? Please yeah, do. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what I mean in the arts, there's um, we now call the intentional fallacy when we try to read the mind of the author of a work and decide what he or she meant. Um, it, it means a different thing to whoever reads it. And I have no idea if there's any sense of um, this concept being in science, whether that actually influenced people in the arts. Well, I think the notion of in intentionality and that sort of thing affects all of, all of, the, all of uh, creativity. Scientific creativity is not that different from uh, creativity in, in the arts and music because uh, you're exploring something you don't know. Uh, I remember I once uh, when I was a graduate student, actually Rob, poet Robert Frost came to Berkeley campus where I was and I went to hear him. And he talked about uh, this marvelous critic that he had. He said, this critic not only knows my first meaning, he knows my second meaning and he knows my third meaning. And the clear implication of Robert Frost's comments was that he didn't have those extra meanings. That was something that the critic had decided to invent. So we're very rich in assuming intentionality, but that's part of the way how we understand the world. We try to figure it out. It's a powerful way. Um, we do it in the arts and sciences alike, and we do it uh, fraught with danger. This may not may not actually correlate well with Darwin, but uh, Frost's most well-known comment in my mind is that when I wrote that, I knew what I meant. But now only God knows. <laughs> and Frost also made the marvelous comment, which I've always remembered: two paths diverged in the woods, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Yes. Mike Brochet has a comment. Deceptive communication could be a factor in the evolutionary demise of humanity if too many people believe big lies. Wow. Uh, well, we are at a pretty dangerous point because now uh, the ability to communicate widely has been dramatically uh, increased. And if you look at our history, um, we uh, we couldn't communicate very much until we had a written language. Uh, you know, we made, uh, until we had a written language, uh, all the wisdom of the culture resided in the brains of old people, and it died when they died. But when we got a written language, you can put it down. But then the second thing you also needed to, to make science go uh, was a printing press. Because early on, you had monks copying Plato and Cicero in the, in the monastery, and you got a few copies. And reading and, and the li literature could be only the purview of a very, very few people in intelligentsia. So the, the combination of written language and the printing press then opened it up. And now we've got the internet, and boy, can we communicate like unbelievably. And unfortunately, it seems to me that, that lies spread faster than the truth. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I think we do have an existential problem you know, that uh, we are able to communicate so vastly and uh, we, don't, we don't have crap detectors. We don't have, we don't have mm -hmm. ways of assessing anything and uh, how we're gonna be able to handle the internet and this, I don't know, but I'm, I'm scared. Mm -hmm. I'm very scared. Dave Danucci has our next question. Dave, why don't you come on live and ask your question? Um, <clears throat> I guess I have two little questions. One is when you were talking about trees communicating with other trees, et cetera, it sounded like that's exactly what we were talking about intentionality. That is, yes, maybe the tree was intending to, or intending, or maybe the initial, um, uh, you know, derivation or evolution of this form of communication was for the tree to communicate with itself, but it still ended up communicating with other trees in the sense that these chemicals or whatever was going on under the root system uh, was being sensed by other trees and was able to be uh, used by them. 
So the intentionality of that seems to be just the same as all the other things you were talking about. But um, I, I, one of the things, um, I have some friends <laughs> who, who find themselves uh, always criticizing Darwin and always saying, you know, Darwinism, that's all past. You know, he, he was so screwed up. He, he made so many mistakes. Uh, let's leave all that behind. Um, you know, we've got to move on. Um, do you hear that kind of criticisms? And, and uh, what, what are they based on? I'm, I've never really understood, even though I've heard him over and over again, I've never really understood the point that he's making. Okay, let me first respond quickly to the trees. Uh, but, uh, I don't, I think the fungi are in charge. Uh, I, don't, I don't think the trees have anything to do with what's going on, but uh, let's go back to, Darwin made some serious mistakes. And the most serious mistake was about genetics. Uh, and like everybody at the time, uh, almost everybody, believed that inheritance was blending. So that, you know, if you, uh, and you see this, you get put together, made a tall person and the short person to get an intermediate person. And in fact, things that have multi-genetic uh, bases, it looks this way. But Darwin also realized that if inheritance was blending, and let's suppose, you know, uh, to use Mendel as an example who discovered that it wasn't, if Mendel had been mating his white peas with red peas, the first generation, what would he end up with was pink peas. <laughs> and so that with uh, genetic variation is reduced by half every generation if inheritance is blending. And Darwin knew that this was a great problem for his, for his old business, whole theory. And, and he made a valiant effort to try to come up with a different theory of genetics. And it was bad, really bad. Um, and uh, it's of historical interest or disinterest now only. Uh, but he recognized uh, that this was really serious. And he believed uh, variation came up when it had to be snapped up by uh, uh, natural selection really rapidly. Mendel, and there's a big debate is, did he read Mendel? Because Mendel had been published. Mm -hmm. and Mendel showed, no, it doesn't. These are, they don't blend. And so inherent uh, variation will be improved, uh, were maintained over time. Um, and we now know that it's made for a long, we can, genes are there from way, way back doing stuff. So uh, uh, Mendel solved the problem that Darwin had. Darwin didn't know it. We don't know if he read the paper and didn't understand it. Nobody understood Mendel. Uh, he was obviously very discouraged. Uh, he went into monastery administration uh -huh. uh, and uh, Mendel wasn't rediscovered uh, and its implications until 1900. Dorman Blazer has a comment. The missing link is within our DNA. Chimpanzee uh, two and three, I think the second and third uh, DNA is combined within us as one gene with remainder of telomere of that two and three be, between within our second gene, that, that there's, um, that, but that we, we have some of the same genes, many of the same genes as uh, chimpanzees. But uh, I'm not sure how to, do you? I think that's referring to uh, the chromosomes two and three having oh. fused. So yes. the, the chimpanzees and other apes have uh, 48 chromosomes and we have 46. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Well, okay. let me see if I can respond a little bit to that. Mm -hmm. Remember, you know, that we have a common ancestor with the chimpanzee, but chimpanzees have evolved since we split. Oh. And, and we're not for sh absolutely sure what that common ancestor was. It isn't today's chimpanzee because they have been evolving all the time that we've been evolving. They haven't evolved as fast because we did wonder unbelievably rapid, but it's, you know, we did not dis 
have a common ancestor with today's chimp. Uh -huh. It's important to remember that, that uh, uh, we shared a common ancestor, and we really don't know what that common ancestor was. And we don't know how much chimps have changed since then. Uh, we're trying to figure that out and we're trying to figure out how much we have changed. But uh, uh, when you think about common ancestors, remember that they're no longer alive. Uh, David Peterson, uh, or David, I'm not sure, David P anyway, uh, has a question. Does bad heredity pass on faster than good heredity? And do men pass on bad heredity faster than women? Uh, his, his example, the, uh, would man A fathering seven sons pass on bad heredity more than a man who fathers seven daughters? It's David Pedworth. David, you've given us a complex thought here. Let's see what the, our good doctor says. Well, <laughs> uh, that's an example of Orion's first law. If you have enough friends, you don't need any enemies. <laughs> uh, well, uh, there is... How to explain this? Because the number of offspring a woman can produce is limited by energy, the energy resources she has to devote to it. It is not in any way enhanced by the number of males with which she copulates. And so uh, the, the, the best thing the female can get is to be very choosy and make sure you get the best father for her kids, you know, get the best genes. Right. Uh, Males, on the other hand, can uh, enhance uh, their reproductive output by mating with multiple females, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, males are famous for doing. Um, and so there's a fundamental difference of, of uh, promiscuous males and choosy females. Now this is widespread through the animal kingdom. Now, what's happened with us, of course, is that as we moved into monogamy, then uh, males are making a big, con which is very unusual in mammals. Most male mammals do have absolutely nothing to do with their offspring. We are really unusual. Male uh, all, ma mammal reproduction is uh, entirely female uh, for parental care. And one of the reasons is that males don't have mammary glands that produce milk. Mm -hmm. But um, that it's entirely uh, uh, female parental care. And, but when we, when we come now to monogamy, in which uh, we, I, I as a male have had you know three kids, and male parental investment never ends. It's been enormous and still is going on. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm funding my grandkids' college education. I got a great granddaughter. I know she's going to ask for something too. Um, so. Uh, when we get into the monogamy, then uh, males has an, have an enormous amount at stake in this. But so, uh, but in general, since males and individual males can uh, uh, enhance their reproduction by mating with multiple females in a way that females can't do, we do have the opportunity for stuff via males to spread more rapidly. It's it's. I've read that I'd say that all of us have some certain percentage of our genome descended from Genghis Khan. So uh, there, there is a real difference and males can spread stuff faster. And in a lot of societies, uh, mammalian societies where uh, the males have nothing to do with their kids, um, it has to be different. And just as an aside, birds here are totally different uh, because uh, other than laying eggs, Male birds can do everything female birds do. And by and large, birds are monogamous, have monogamous parental care. Whereas in mammals, uh, the, the only monogamous parental care mammal in existence is, is us. Joyce, you have a comment about the film Fantastic Fungi and with exclamation points. Can you tell us a little more about the movie? If you haven't seen that, uh, it re I believe it reinforces Gordon's point about how we, we assume that trees communicate. But um, even with their roots touching, fun fantastic fungi argues that it's the fungi doing the work. Mm -hmm. If there's any communication going on, it's with the fungi. And how much there's causation between that and what a tree does, I have no idea. Gordon would have to comment on that. But I also wanted to say that um, 
in relation to the um, parental care, there's a delightful film now, um, I think it's on Netflix, called Penguin Town. Mm -hmm. And um, in fact, the the uh, woman who recommended Dr. Orion's to us um, is an expert in that field. But it shows that uh, in, the parents, the male parent does contribute equally to the female parent because one has to leave and get the food while the other watches the nest and then the other one leaves to get food while the other while the first one watches the nest so that um, they're both very involved. And in one situation, they actually filmed a, a group of penguins over an entire nesting season. The female never came back from the hunt, so she may have been eaten by a seal. Who knows what happened to her? Um, but the male has to run back and forth and do all of this, and it creates quite a, a problem. But any comment? And, and most, mostly these, the birds that have biparental care, they need both males and females. They can't do it alone. Uh -huh. uh, but back to the uh, uh, fantastic fungi uh, i had deep problems with that film uh, oh. we seem to be more interested in, in humans going high on uh, fungal <laughs> than, but, but the amazing thing to me was that they never described the deep relationship between the fungi and the plants nearly all land plants form very in intimate relationships with one of a couple of different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi that actually attached to the roots and they develop uh, growth into the roots of the tree. And the, the tree pays for the fungi because fungi don't photosynthesize and they're burning up energy. And the tree is paying this fungi, so to speak, to break down rocks and do various other things that enhance the ability of the trees to pick up uh, nutrients from the soil. And most land plants simply don't grow without the fungi. It's a, a deep and ancient evolutionary relationship, which that film never mentioned at all. I just couldn't believe. You're gonna talk about the fungi and plants and, and never describe what it is because it is absolutely fascinating and, and, and incredible. Uh, so, uh, failing to describe what it is that the fungi are really doing then didn't enable them to think seriously how probably uh, the contact between the trees have been fostered by the fungi because uh, the fungus doesn't, it, it's totally unrelated to whatever tree it's with. Uh, and if another tree is helped out, the fungi will benefit. So, uh, the, the fungus being in a totally different kingdom from the, from the plants and the animals uh, benefits in very different ways. So the, there was a wonderful story to be told there. They didn't mention it at all. And I just, I just found that movie unbelievable. Some claim that uh, Darwinism supports war and conflict. Others say um, he didn't mean that at all. Uh, the survival of the fittest, I think, is uh, she's referring to. I may be wrong. Uh, well, first, let me say that uh, survival of the fittest is a terrible statement. Darwin never used it. I think Herbert Spencer came up with it later. But uh, what do you mean survival of the fittest? Um, I mean, how, how do you to, 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 uh, define fitness? Mm -hmm. Well, it's those who survive. So I mean, this is totally circular reasoning. It tells us absolutely nothing. And, for good reason, Darwin didn't use it. But, but by using it that way, and then there was social Darwinism saying that, okay, that uh, the weak, the weak uh, to die off. And so all sorts of stuff came on with social Darwinism, which has nothing to do with Darwinism. Fundamentally, Darwinism is neutral about all of that stuff. Um, and so we've, we had this, uh, people who who think that poor people are poor because they're uh, dumb, and and that the blacks are, are were less, uh, they found it very advantageous to think uh, in these terms of superiority. So it's it served other social needs. It is a total aberration and, and destruction of what what is involved in natural selection, which is morally neutral. There's nothing there. Thank you. Robert Stanford has a comment just about the DNA. We have 98% of the same DNA as the chimpanzees. Is his yeah. comment back about that. Yeah. Uh, David uh, Pedworth had two, tri two trivial comments. 
Male geese are monogamous and stay with the young until they can fly. One Wedgwood Darwin descendant was the composer Ralph Vaughn Williams. Ralph Vaughn Williams? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. So that was just something he, he found out and wanted to share with us. Yeah. I, I have a question that, that really, I find this fascinating that a gentleman at Darwin who could come up with such a powerful ideas that there's, there's no designer. Uh, and it's, it's kind of, as I've become a stronger humanist during my life, uh, it just, I find it's, it's the core, the core of my belief now is that there is no designer uh, and very reassuring. And yet in our society today, religion continues to be a very strong, including with this, uh, with the COVID vaccine, uh, that now uh, you can be a, you know, you can be have a deferment from the vaccine because of a medical issue, be also because of religious belief. And it's kind of like, wait a minute here, the doctor and a, a minister, priest, imam, whatever, has yeah. the same power that that doesn't, that, that's, that's been really kind of driving me crazy. And, uh, and I'm the first one just like Darwin to when my friends bring up the power of God, I just am silent. I don't, I never challenge that. Um, I, I uh, when it's just, you know, God, I found the answer through God, or uh, it's, it means to me very just their belief system. Sure. But now with this, I'm, I'm finding like, man, maybe I better be a little bit more verbal in the future. Sure. I, I'd really appreciate your thoughts about that. Yeah. Design without a designer is really a radical idea. Yeah. Still it, is. It, it is an amazing idea, and it seems counterintuitive, and it seems all wrong. Mm -hmm. But there's still there's some real uh, advantages that come with having a designer, and that is if, if there's a designer, you, there's somebody you can communicate with, and you can cut deals, and right. that drives so much of religion. Uh, throughout the northern hemisphere, there. There were these winter solstice ceremonies, and, and they knew exactly. And you go to a place like Stone, Stonehenge, which is the most famous of those examples, and it was set up that the sunlight shaft was come right through at the winter solstice. Exactly, they knew exactly where the sun was going to go. They had figured this all out, but they assumed that there was gods in charge of this. And so the whole point of the winter solstice ceremony at Stonehenge and other places was to convince, to do a ceremony, uh, to convince the gods to turn around. So they were real worried. They didn't understand what was going on. They calculated everything, but they had no idea about causation <laughs> and figured that uh, maybe, this, maybe the gods would decide that the days would keep getting shorter and get worse and worse. And maybe we could, if we pled to the god and did some, made some special ceremonies, uh, they would change their mind and turn around. And of course, this has got to be the most su successful religious ceremony ever performed. It had 100% effectiveness, uh, and it was all over. And uh, it, in, in this connection, it is no accident that Jesus was born on the winter solstice. That's a, uh, this is one of the winter solstice ceremonies that got incorporated into Christian belief. So these are these are powerful ideas that if you can. You can cut deals with somebody, and as I, as I mentioned earlier, the entire Catholic Church is built on that. Uh, and the power they have over people is that people think they can cut deals with God. You pay us some money and we'll cut the deals for you. So that's wonderful. Darwin offers no deals. There are no deals to be cut. You know, you're on your own, baby, you know? <laughs> it's, so the appeal of, of gods is strong because it gives you some opportunities. Darwinism, no deal. No deal. No deal. No deal. Hank Robb has a question. Come on in, Hank. Here you go. I was just going to add a couple of things. Um, uh, one is the um, behavioral psychology uh, equivalent to design without a designer is thoughts without a thinker. 
And uh, that is preceded a long way by uh, Buddhist ideas a couple of thousand years before. Yeah. So uh, the implications, but my point is the implications of this idea of something without a something rumble on in other areas. Now, I want to ask uh, something um, because I have been saying this for a long time because I was once told it was true, but um, I would like to see if you can verify it for me. <laughs> and that is that a male human being shares as much genetic material with a male chimpanzee as it shares with a female human being and vice versa which is why the other sex seems more like an alien species to us um, than, than one of us. Is it true that we in fact uh, have that kind of genetic material distribution? I think not, no. uh, but it is, the amount of genes shared is, is a very slippery concept because obviously we are behaviorally and computationally with brain size unbelievably different from a chimpanzee. But you know, we share an awful lot with amoebae. You know, uh, we have a common genetic heritage. We, uh, as Richard Dawkins says, you know, if when I reproduce, I can't reproduce myself. I pass genes on in real in different combinations. So as Richard Dawkins says, we are the vehicles, the genes are the replicators. And uh, even if I, if I desire to, which I don't, to pass on Gordon, I can't. Um, I, I can, I can uh, throw some genes into a pot and my three kids didn't look anything like Gordon, which was a good thing. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, so the, the amount of genes in common is, is a very slippery notion. Now, that said, um, males and females in our species have been subjected to very different selective pressures. Because we are behaviorally, we, we male uh, human beings, I have some worthless uh, nipples up here uh, that have never put and won't produce any milk. Uh, so what is selected males and competition among males and how we behave is very different. And females have been subjected to a very a different sort of regime, which is and some of the things that are different about the way females behave and males behave make sense in terms of our evolutionary roles. Um, that, uh, so uh, just asking how many genes we share in common uh, that really is not a way to look at things at all because uh, wh whatever th that number may be, uh, we are dramatically different from a chimpanzee. And I am much more different from a chimpanzee than I was from my wife. Dramatically different. My wife, right? You know, I mean, my wife was another human being that I could talk to and fall in love with and have kids and all of this, none of which I can do with a chimpanzee. And this has nothing to do with how, what percentage of genes we happen to have in common. That's, that's a statistic people like to mention. I think it's a very useless, misleading statistic. We should drop it. Just like survival of the fittest, we should drop it. Don't ever use it. Darwin didn't use it. He was smart. And I do, that wasn't, it, that was my, you know, I kind of added that to Helen's, uh, or something. Yeah. that's what I was thinking she was referring to, but I'm so glad that you, that makes perfect sense. And I'm yeah. so glad it came up because I will never use it again. Yeah. Uh, Mike Perche okay. makes a really lovely comment. Adaptability is the key to evolution rather than physical strength or intellect. Survival of the most flexible is what he's recommending. And I'm, we're going to finish up here. Uh, Joyce has a comment. Seems as though the human ego can be its most harmful enemy. Just wondering if it is balanced by the positive. Guess that's not in any way related to Darwinism, but Darwin's concept did give the ego a big shock. Okay. Yeah. Well, to whatever our brains and all the features of our brains and everything in it was devolved, evolved by a natural selection. Right. So that um, all of the traits we have must have evolved because they're useful. Uh, 
but uh, and the way they're useful is interesting because many of them are useful as individuals. Uh, but if the individual goes and exploiting it, uh, it's not good for society. And if you look at uh, the Ten Commandments, they're mostly "Thou shalt not," mm -hmm. uh, and the, and what "Thou shalt not" is something that is um, uh, useful, beneficial to the person doing it, but not useful to the society. But as as Sigmund Freud once memorial, uh, one of the most famous comments he ever made was that that which no one wishes to do need not be prohibited. That which no one wishes to do need not be prohibited. <laughs> and so what's in any social organism, there are tendencies that individuals will benefit from doing and the society has uh, various methods, rules and various other things to, uh, to uh, prevent that from happening. And uh, uh, ability to control cheaters and deal with them is absolutely essential for uh, any society to work. So that this constant tension, because there's a lot of things that individuals can do that will immediately benefit them, that will, will be detrimental to society. And this is true at the gene level too. Now, uh, what cancer is, the, is cells that have escaped the control. There's also control systems genetically that keep cells in line and stops them from, from, from going bananas reproduce. So cancer is a loss, loss of control of these interactions at, at, that, at that level, just like uh, when, at a societal uh, level. And so uh, there's this constant battle at all levels between benefits to the individual and benefits to the society mm -hmm. and any highly social organism has evolved all sorts of methods to deal with that. And that's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> oh, Dr. Lorenz, that was really, you had, we had so many questions. You, you really got a lively conversation going here, which I think we'll be able to continue, I hope, in Afterthought. Mm -hmm.